Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptee podcast. So we have a guest on today. And if anybody knows her onions when it comes to adoption, it's the guest we have today. I'm delighted to welcome to the show Joyce Maguire Pavo. Lovely to have you on the show, Joyce. Really looking forward to this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. So Joyce and I had a chat a couple of a uh, few weeks ago now. Um, and uh, we came up with a whole load of real nuggets of uh, of of gold that uh, Joyce has got to share with you. And we the first one that we said we'd kick off with is pathologizing ourselves. So what what is pathologizing ourselves and why do you think that that's a, a big thing for us adoptees? Well, let me give you just a tiny bit of background so people know where I'm coming from. Um, obviously, I'm adopted. You don't speak to anyone who isn't, right, Simon? Right. <laughs> and um, I was adopted in 1946 in the dark ages. And I have been working in the world of adoption for 55 years. Uh, and I, I decided, I have many degrees from Harvard University and other places, not to brag about those places, but no one believed there was a psychology of adoption when I was studying it. And so I had to go to a university that would have uh, a plum and that would be accepted uh, because the subject wasn't. So I, you know, I studied and I worked and I, uh, you know, started clinics, specialty clinics that were just for adoption and complex blended families like foster care, kinship care, similar to adoption. And, and those places that I developed were different than other places. Really, mine was the only center in the United States and today there's probably only a couple of similar ones that dealt with uh, you know, the clinical issues, the mental health issues, the training of people around adoption that had nothing to do with placement. All of the people that were doing this work back in the day were also working at adoption agencies. And I felt that was a conflict of interest. I felt that really this needed to be something very separate. And the people doing the work needed to be very competent and aware of the issues of adoption. And I felt that they shouldn't be automatically pathologized. Because in my experience up to a certain point, it, most of the mental health issues, it's a medical model. So you're looking for disease. You're looking to cancel out what's wrong to find out what's really going on. So there is a pathologizing factor to most of these situations. And adoption was pathologized. Adoptees were um, different. Uh, birth parents were pathologized. And to some extent, adopted parents were less than the birth parents and much less than the adoptees. The people who would show up for treatment were often even young adoptees whose parents would say, there's something wrong with my child. Does it have to do with adoption? Um, and, you know, there was automatically this pathologizing. There's something wrong with this child. Well, I think over the years, I tried to make this known. And nowadays with programs like yours and many others, there's much more information available. And I think that both practitioners and people who are dealing with adoption have the opportunity to learn what is difficult and what isn't. I'll be glad to share with you, Simon. I, I did a developmental sheet um, years ago for the Department of Mental Health uh, in my state. And um, I did it because I had worked at Harvard with Eric Erickson, who was the father of developmental theory. And um, I the, the developmental stages that I wrote about were from zero to 18, but we could go on to 98. 
Um, and they were uh, looking at what is considered normal development. And that was the first line. The second line for me was normal under the circumstances of adoption. Because automatically with the trauma and loss that an adopted person has experienced, there is a different process that goes on in those stages. And I don't consider that path. Then the third stage is the things that are really wrong that you really need to look for. And some adoptees may have some mental health issues that are more extreme, but too many of them were being slotted into situations and medications that really weren't appropriate because they were dealing with what was really normal under the circumstances of adoption. So I'll stop there and see what yeah. you have to say, but that's sort of a quickie. View. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, I, I sorry, I I just assume because you're such a legend, right? You know, I, I just assume I, I didn't do the intro bit because everybody, you know, uh, but yeah, 1946. So that's yeah, 21 years before me, um, and uh, yeah, what's what's wrong with me? You know, there's there's a uh, if if that's what everybody's looking for, I, I think culturally, like this is an adoption thing. I think in the western world we we are we have a kind of uh learned negative negativity bias don't we like it, we're we're focusing on what's wrong rather than what what's what's right we seem to be yeah and I think people, no. people like to have a diagnosis because it makes them feel like, oh, okay, if I find out what's wrong, there's a treatment and I'll be fixed. Um, and so people collude with the, the uh, diagnosticians in feeling like there's something terribly wrong with them. And there is something, I'm not, I'm not debating the fact that we all have lots of issues and concerns and feelings. But I do believe many of those are very, very normal. And if we had been given the support and the skills and strategies to deal with those, we might not have gotten deeper into considering ourselves to be, you know, to be wrong. So is this um, one of the things that's been coming up for me uh, uh, this this morning is uh, and for a while ago uh, I heard this this phrase um, confirmation bias quite a while ago uh, and um, I, I remember it as what the what the thinker thinks the prover proves um, I, I, how how would it, how would you define that confirmation bias exactly as you said I think that that's very true I think if you if you're looking for something and then you get something and then you want to believe that so you can get to the next step, you may uh, confirm for yourself something that isn't true. Uh, for instance, uh, in the, well, it still goes on, but particularly in the 1980s, I rarely saw an adopted child or a foster child that didn't have ADHD, rarely. I mean, they're across the board, they were all taking the meds that were needed for ADD, ADHD. They all were diagnosed with that diagnosis. And if you don't have the right diagnosis, you don't have the right treatment. And I found that many of the, a couple of them did, uh, you know, a handful of people absolutely had that diagnosis, but many of them had post-traumatic stress had depression and anxiety from the loss and from the trauma early on. And a lot of that looks like ADD and ADHD. There's a lot of difficulty focusing. There's a lot of distraction. I mean, these are very common symptoms for several different problems, but everyone confirmed that, yes, this is ADD, ADHD, let's give them some Ritalin or some uh, whatever is the current medication and move on. But it wasn't doing very much for some of them because that wasn't the correct diagnosis. And there was no 
acknowledgement that these children had had previous traumas, some of them very severe traumas, some of, some of them less so, but still traumas. And they had all had losses that had not been grieved and that had not been accepted or acknowledged in any way. And yeah. so I, I think we have to look very carefully and, you know, with the with the rise of the internet, people love to diagnose themselves and each other. They'll jump on and look at the symptoms for blah, blah, blah. I, I, I remember seeing a 13-year-old adoptee from Korea once, and her father came in before her session and said, Joyce, I think that Lindsay is bipolar. I've looked it up, and all of the things are there. She's definitely bipolar. And I looked at him and said, John, Lindsay is a 13-year-old adoptee. She is not bipolar. She's annoying as hell. She's driving you crazy. She goes from one extreme to the other. She's not bipolar. I've been seeing her for months, and I tell you, she is not bipolar. Now, another practitioner who didn't understand adoption might say, oh, yes, I think you're right. I do see that and might have prescribed some heavy duty medication that was inappropriate. Yeah. So I, I um, happen to, the thing about this, th th there's still misdiagnosis happening today, right? Oh, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully it's better than, 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 uh, than, it, than it was. But um, the, 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 the reason why there are misdiagnoses, it, it seems to me to be, and I'd, I'd love you, a, a, a more informed opinion on it, is because the symptoms uh, are quite often very vaguely described. So I, I looked at, um, I, I don't know what it was, somebody, somebody mentioned depression to me 15 years ago. I went on the internet and looked looked at, you know, like if you got four or more of these things, then it's different. But they were very vague. They were very vague. So it, it's, it, it's like we, we think that, if we're not a scientist, right, we we think we 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 remember back to our science at school when we're doing a chemistry experiment, and you've got a list of ingredients. Oh, sorry, a list of, a, an equipment, a list of equipment, including the chemical compounds that you're going to use, and you've got a, a procedure, and you're gonna it, you combine these two things, and it's going to create this, and 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 it it's absolutely nailed on and crystal clear what's mm -hmm. involved and, and we think that diagnoses are crystal clear but they're not they're, there's lots of woolly woolly bits around the edge you know well, the thing is simon that hard science is hard science and with chemistry you get what you get with math you get what you get with psychology it is woolly it is you know it it's I think you have to leave yourself open and understanding of other things. That's why uh, under the circumstances of adoption, trauma, and loss, you may see something very different. And it's important to know that. I'm not suggesting that many of us don't need to be diagnosed and to get the treatment that will be best for us. But I think it's important that the people working with us make sure they have an understanding of what's going on and not make assumptions that are, you know, not taking into consideration what we've been through. Yeah. And my, my own take on this is like, so me, me, I, I came out of the fog very late, I think, um, for, comparatively speaking, um, at, at, at 40, you know, and this the this subconscious stuff came out, and some anger came up towards my uh, birth mother, and a bit later, some fear of rejection from a birth mother. But uh, I I've said this before on the podcast, but my my, my primal wound, if if that's what it was, it, it's it feels like a um, a, a paper cut, whereas um, some people's there's a spectrum um, of uh, there's a, there's a there's a spectrum of the 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 size of the primal wound 
And then you've got other trauma laying on, layering on top of it. So trauma that may have happened, happened before the adoption in, in within the biological family, Tra- trauma that may happen in the adoptive family by parents who aren't, you know, in, in the right space themselves. There might be that another layer of that transracial adoption where the, we, we, we feel different. Uh, transracial adoptees feel, sorry, all adoptees, not some adoptees feel different. And then they not only do they feel different, they, they look different and that kind of compounds itself. And then you've got the later, late, later, um, late discovery adoptees, which adds another piece. So these are all kind of layers of the, of the trauma. I, as a white guy adopted by white parents, uh, and and uh, who didn't put me through any trauma. I don't. I, I just have that first layer, and it and it's kind of skinny. Um. So what it felt to me was like the uh, as I read the primal wound, I could actually feel myself. First was a kind of a relief of the diagnosis, but then I could actually feel myself doing this confirmation bias so it, and, and the, the metaphor i use for this is like a, a a trauma ball so it's like a snowball you know when you you scoop up some snow um it, it, it between your hands and then you you make it into a into a ball and then you roll it along the roll it along the ground and you've got the basis of a snowman snow woman uh gender liquid whatever snow person right um and that's what that that's the expression sorry that was my uh, personal experience and all our adopt- adoptees experience. But I feel that confirmation bias for me deepened my trauma. Um, so the diagnosis was followed, which was a relief, was followed by this compounding of the, uh, of the trauma as the confirmation bias kicked in. And, and that, so um have you seen much of that is is this just a weird one-off uh, for no no I, I think it's very true i think that trauma is cumulative and um you know the other thing i ran a clinic for 30 years and i had 25 employees who i worked very hard to make sure they were all adoption competent and uh able to work with all the parties involved in adoption and I think that that's, you know, that's very, very important. And I think that some people, even in their training, if they had a personal connection to adoption, I would really work on making sure they understood that their story was a case study of one. That your story is your story and it's very important. It's very real. It, but it is not, it cannot be put on someone else. You cannot assume that your experience is no. like someone else's. So as you described, there are so many different kinds of adoption. There's foster care adoption, older child adoption. There's kinship adoption. There's step-parent adoption. There's infant adoption domestic. There's adoption international. There's adoption transracial there are many, many, many different kinds of adoption. And the, the basic issues, the emotional and psychological issues are similar. And, and, and now we have NP, you know, we have people from donor situations and I mean, it grows. And these are all people with a similar experience and a lack of trust because of the secrecy and the difficulty that's gone on. Uh, and but each of them have a very different story. You know, if you go on any of the groups for adoption, or if you listen to any of the podcasts for adoption, there are people who are absolutely they have been terribly abused by not only their experience of adoption, but their adoptive parents. They're very angry at the their lot in life because of all of this, and they're absolutely right for them. But that's not true for someone like yourself who, you know, you you went about your life and felt okay with it. And then you woke up to some of these issues and realized that, you know, you you really weren't seeing some of the things that were causing you distress that you didn't even really have a name for. And so, um, you know, finding those things out does 
confirm for you that there's something really wrong. I think what's important for us to know, there's two different things I, I like to work on. And I like people to split these things in two so they don't get confused. The system of adoption anywhere in the world is horrible. It's done wrong for the wrong reasons in the wrong way. And the child is not the centerpiece and the best interest of the child really isn't being taken care of no matter what anyone says. So the whole practice of adoption, and some people say we should just abolish it. Well, maybe we should abolish the word, but the fact of a child needing parents and not having parents who are safe or who are available or who are alive means that some children are gonna be raised by different people. But how do we do that? How do we do that openly? How do we keep them connected to their name, their culture, their connections that are still there for them that are safe? How do we do it differently? And how do we do it so it isn't child trafficking or bordering on child trafficking? How do we do it so that there is no money involved, that it's about human life? And even the even the DNA, even the donor and surrogate situations, you can't sell any of your organs. Why can you sell your eggs and your sperm? It's, you know, there, there's something really wrong with how we treat that child who's going to come into existence and is going to be a person in the world dealing with all of this. So I think if you're really angry about this and you want to get involved, you get involved in changing the laws about adoption and changing the policies and in changing the practices. Then if you want to be, uh, you know, doing podcasts, doing uh, coaching, doing therapy, doing any other work that works with those of us who are adopted or who are birth parents or who are adopted parents, then you need to understand much more about what this practice has done to these people and how to help them to be as strong and as whole as they can be, in, not in a pathologizing way. And my goal, I work with, uh, I love working with adoptees. And I feel like that you're doing that. And I think that's so important. But I think that going forward, if we don't give the adoptive parents and the birth parents the tools they need, we're not helping those little babies and children who are now coming up after us. So we can't just say adoption's horrible. Let's not talk to adoptive parents. Let's not really deal with these birth parents who are double rejecting us or whatever. We need to help all of those people to help the kids that are coming up before we change this other piece that really needs reconstruction. Anyway, that's my rant. I'll okay. stop. <laughs> um, I, when I started this podcast, um, I had adoptive parents on, adoptees on, and adoptive parents that run uh, agencies on, and some people who aren't adoptive parents, but also run agencies. And I started to get um, some speaking gigs and I thought that's great because we can do the the, the adopted parents can hear from um, uh, adoptees mm -hmm. but I and that was a trickle of engagement started happening I thought okay well that's great I'll, I'll double down on this and, and and but what I found was that they are not focused on post-adoption the agencies they'd like to be but their time resources mean that they're not so I thought, well, what what's more what what's more meaningful for me? It, it's that adoptees um, and focusing on adoptees. And that's if anybody's listening, wondering why I don't have an adoptive parents on the show anymore, it's because of that. Because I want to focus on ad adoptees. I enjoy the conversations more. I have more in common, and and that, and it's more meaningful for me. The key word that you said was strength, right? As strong as as strong as we can be, as whole as we can be. Um, and I want to, I want to I, I, I just dive down on that word strength. Um, so, what what do you mean by strength? Is it strength of character, emotional strength? What what, what does what what do you mean by strength? 
I want to answer your question, Simon, but first I want to say, please don't take my, I mean, I agree with you and there need to be all of us working with different segments. I love that you work with adoptees. I do a group within Heffron and we just do work with adoptees. And um, I think every party needs their own thing. But I think in general, if we want to make change, we need to do some of everything. At, but I'm not suggesting everyone can or should do that. So I just want to put that over here. As far as strength goes, I, I'm trying to do the opposite of pathologizing without ignoring one of the past faults in terms of uh, ignoring issues. Because of the secrecy in adoption, often people would simply ignore Oh, that's nothing. I just had a, a case today where an older brother told his younger sister in a family therapy session, oh, when are you going to get over this adoption stuff? I've been over it for ages. Just let it go. And I butted right in and said, Roberto, um, she's never going to get over it. This is part of her life and it's part of yours. You're ignoring it right now, which is fine. Everyone should do whatever they need to do to survive and thrive. And everyone has different pacing. But your sister's pacing is she is thinking about this 24 hours a day, and it's driving her a little bit crazy. She's not crazy, but this, this intrusive thinking is in her way. So it doesn't help to not talk about it. What would help is to talk about it. So, you know, I think that strength means finding the ways to find strategies, to find skills, to find groups like yours, podcasts like yours and groups that that are current these days in uh, on social media and live are very, very important because I don't know if you're aware of Bruce Perry, who's a very yeah. good trauma person. Uh, one of his little tiny quotes that I use all the time is what's shareable is bearable. When you get into a group that's all adoptees, even though you all have slightly different stories and different situations, there's something it triggers in terms of, oh, I feel that too. That's That happened to me. That's I think that way also sometimes. You know, if you just live in your mind all by yourself, you can easily take yourself down a rabbit hole and begin to think there's something really wrong. And you can begin to doubt yourself and you can begin to confirm biases that aren't necessarily true. But if you if you have other people to sort of put things out, even if it's just a therapist or just a, a group, it's getting stuff out of your head onto the table and talking about it gives you the opportunity to move it around and make sense of it. And there is strength in doing that. And having someone tell you, oh, you're not crazy. This is what 68% uh, of adoptees feel this way. Not everybody does, but a large number of adoptees feel exactly what you're saying you feel. Um, I think the more you get that kind of... Uh, acknowledgement, that kind of collaboration, the more it strengthens you and makes you feel. Now, you're never going to be, I, I, people don't like it when I say this, you're never going to be fixed and you're never going to be whole. You were taken and moved and transplanted and changed. And that has made you a different person than you would have been. It doesn't have to have judgment. It's not bad or good, but it's a fact. So we're not going to fix that. Even finding your birth mother. I have an adoptee who, um, and her adoptive parents were wonderful. They unadopted her because the only way she could have a birth certificate that was legal to use for her visa or for anything was to be adopted by her birth parents. So her adoptive parents unadopted her so that her birth parents could adopt her. And then now her birth certificate says the names of the people who gave birth to her through a very circuitous route. But do you think that fixed her? 
Do you think she feels whole? Well, um, it, no, because it's it's stuff on the external. It's stuff on yeah. the external, and um, you know, I had a recorded another episode uh, of the podcast earlier on today, and a, a lot of the, the I was talking about this sort of topic um, with a late do- discovery adoptee, uh, Doctor Sib, um, and. You know, she made it very clear to to me uh, that this is th- th- these are words we're talking about. You know, and and verbiage and different things mean different things to different people, right? So, um, I, and I, I come at this because of my curiosity as kind of a, I ask some really essential question. Well. It's, 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 it's um, what some people might think dumb questions like so I'll say so what's wounded you know what's wounded by what's what's what is the primal wound and I'll I say, oh, and I did a podcast I did a a, a, a webinar on this turned into a podcast well on one hand it's a diagnosis as we've said you know and on another hand it's a it's a metaphor right so it's it's a metaphor it's a diagnosis with a for a load of different symptoms uh, on another hand it's a a, a, a metaphor. Um, and and in some extent, it, it's uh, for me, it's a, it felt like a belief, right? It felt like a belief, and it's all of those things. But then I say something like, "Well, what's wounded?" or "Well, what 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 does whole mean? What does fixed mean?" I mean, it, it, it's it's all kind of it, it, it's it's all up in it's all up in the air. We have to our heads can't get round stuff that 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 aren't objects. So we have to kind of take abstract things like feelings and, and, and you, and come up with metaphors, uh, but, but the, the metaphor, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the primal wound. It's, you know, like it's, uh, it, it, it's like, it's the primal wound. Be afraid, be very afraid, you know? Um, and, and, uh, there's some shock, there's, there's, there's a, a degree of shock tactics, there you know and we're drawn to that um but i i so i say when i say well what we can never be whole we can never be fixed well it what do you what do you mean by that what well does people have come on the podcast and said well i I don't think i'm a thriving adoptee why well because i sometimes feel bad well that doesn't mean that you're not thriving they and i've had emails for people maybe i should listen to your show simon um, uh, you know, but I don't consider myself a thriving adoptee. Well, it's, it's a silly thing to say, really, isn't it? But you know, like to to um, to define something before you've before you've listened to it. You know, that's not really the right way to do it. You've got to you've got to have an, this, the, the, you know, it. Yeah, it only takes half an hour, an hour, or an hour to listen to one of the podcasts or listen to it for ten minutes. And hear what we're saying. So it is all lost in the in the verbiage, but um yeah, are you ever gonna be fixed? Well, are you gonna be whole? Well, what's what's broken? What what's the primal wound? I I, I said, well, what's wounded to me, it's my sense of identity, right? It's it's my feelings, right? Yeah. So, but am I my sense of identity? Is can you put can you draw you talked about hard science and math earlier on, you know, we call it maths in the UK, but can, can I do a little equation? Right, that says my sense of self equals an equal sign, me, identity. Is, is that who I am, my sense of self? It, well, my sense of that is no, my, my sense of self isn't is a is a is a concept. It's not, it's a it's a belief, it's it's not it's it's not who I am. I can't say my sense of self isn't who I am. So my sense of self, yeah, that's being damaged. Is that me? No. And does this sound like philosophical waffling? Maybe it does to some, but to me it doesn't. These are these are deep things, deep things. What 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 do we mean by identity? What do we mean by broken? What do we mean by fixed? What do we mean by wounded? What you know, like uh, and here's here's one for you that's been going on in, in my head at the moment. How, how does this how does an event, the event of relinquishment, 
um, the the and, and the the emotional feeling, pre-verbal feeling of loss uh, and and bewilderment and scared and all those things. How does that become a thought, a belief? I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. There's there's some there's there's a well, you know there's there's a lot of men, mental shenanigans that happens between that takes an event and makes and, and gives it meaning, right? Right, right. Well, I think that um, you know it's not it's dangerous to say you can't be fixed and you can't. You, it's not you can't be fixed. There, there's always, you're never going to change the reality of what happened. Even if you make this birth certificate, even if you do something else. No. To, that's, never, a, that's just external stuff. Right, right. But you can, you can work on strength and wholeness. And it's very possible to get yourself to a good place. And everyone is going to do it differently. And you're right, people take this information, this pre-verbal and pre-cognitive situation, or in another language, you were born in China and you were two and a half when you came to the United States and uh, you didn't speak any language until you spoke a language, but you had recessive language already in your mind. And your body, I, I love Bessel van der Kolk's work, um, The Body Keeps the Score, because preverbal and precognitive situations, even in utero, what happened in utero to you has helped to construct your nervous system in a certain way. And not everything is genetic. Some things are, you know, uh, things that happened in other ways. And I, I think we don't pay enough attention to the combined situations we've been in and how they've altered and moved things along for us. Now, not everything is negative and not everything is a permanent disaster. Um, people are different and people are resourceful and people are resilient. And so some people can put this together in their head and make sense of it in one way and can understand that, um, you know, intellectually, this was going to happen. And it wasn't really about me. It was about a situation. And other people are going to take that and feel much more personally. I mean, not that all of it isn't personal, but the way you make sense of it. Um, so I, I think Part of what one might do in therapy, and there are so many different modalities and so many wonderful ways to work on all of these issues, but one of the things is reframing, a, a little bit of narrative therapy, a little bit of <clears throat> telling yourself the story in a different way and making sense of it in a different way. I, I personally love Nancy Verrier as a person. I've known her for years and years, and she's referred clients to me. I've referred clients to her, but I never liked the title of the book. <laughs> and um, I think it's been wonderful in terms of getting people to read it. And I think what she says in there is important. And she has been an ally. She is an adoptive parent, so she doesn't have her information comes from her own children and her clients. Um, and I think that's important. It's always important if you're reading research or reading anything to know who the writer is and where this came from. Um, and good for Nancy for getting that the beginning of all of this is important and has made a huge impact on all of us. But it, it's it's a bit pathologizing for me. That's just my style and my thing. I it it sounds crippling in some way, and it's it, wounds are terrible, but they and they leave scars, and you won't get rid of the scar unless you have some fancy plastic surgery. Um, but it, it's not always it's important for people to be able to see these things, learn these things, accept these things, but not to over identify 
with some of the things that might not be their own issues that they may adapt to in an in a non-adaptive way. So that I mean that's I, I just think we have to read things carefully and realize not every single thing relates to our own experience. We're a case study of one. Yeah. It's a great point. Uh, here's a, here's a, 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 a random thing that I discovered a couple of months ago. The Primal Wound book has 1,400 reviews on Amazon. And her follower book um, has 70. And it's called Coming Home to Self or something like that. Um, and I'm thinking, why is that? Why would that? be why would because the first book is about the problem and the second book is about healing right now why why would if if only 1400 like does where are we focused you know where are we putting our focus as as adoptees or adoptive parents for that matter if yeah and i don't know obviously how many books how many of book one have sold and how many book two have sold but the but the um it it seems to me that uh it, it seems to me by the number of um uh, uh, the number of reviews that we are we're talking ourselves into a corner we, we're throwing up our hands in the air and saying helpless i'm stuck with it and I, I, I guess that's because from my case study of one, <laughs> that's how I felt for a while, right? But I can look at it in the number. That, that That's not a case study of one, looking at the fact that she's got 1,400. And I hope that's right. It's 1,400, I think, on Amazon.com and 70. Something like that. And I, I thought it was amazing. Like, So, you know, where are we focusing? What, to what extent are we stuck in this confirmation bias that, you know, we're stuck with the, we're stuck with the wound? You know, how... how yeah, as I say, I notice some odd things. I don't know if this is the answer, and it probably isn't. It's just something I'm going to say. But yeah, go for it. I think that the timing of the primal wound was very important. It came at a time when people wanted the verification that what they were feeling or seeing was real and true and that there was a problem. The, we went from saying, everything's fine, love will fix everything, adoptees are gonna be just fine, they're all, they're all just fine, just don't even worry about it, to there are these serious problems, there are people who are having you know struggles that are very real. So we went from nothing to everything and didn't sort of go to the middle until more recently but still I don't think we're there and I think people this is sort of a self-help book in a way and so it both helped and and hurt it woke people up and put them in a you know two steps back three steps forward but it was hard to read and to begin to take that in I I think the second book again, might be a problem of timing. I don't think people were, I think people were still pretty fixated on my therapist, my parents, other people don't get this. They're not acknowledging my pain. They're not acknowledging my trauma. So that's still going on and people are still trying to get verification. They're trying to get collaboration on those facts. And I think that's, that's a bit of why that is, you know, more popular than the second book. Yeah. I think that's that's what's going on. The second book is very thick. It's very psychological and it's very scientific and it's really, really hard work. Yeah. Um, and like, it's, you know, it's more of a textbook. I think you, yeah. uh, the uh, the book that I wrote that did pretty well was for everyone, and it was called The Family of Adoption. And I wrote that so that a fifth grader could read. I mean, it, it's not, a t it's both a text and a trade book, but it's written in a very simple way because there were points I wanted to get across. And, uh, you know, 
it's old, so it's not up to date in any way. But I think, you know, it's important to know what you're reading. And you're right. The second book is a textbook. It's for practitioners. It's not going to be easy reading. Then you take someone like B.J. Lifton, my dear friend, who I, uh, you know, still sad about her loss. Um, she wrote some amazing books. She's a writer and she's an adoptee. And she wrote from the inside out and she kept you riveted. She brought in all of her, she wrote children's books before she wrote these books. And so she was a storyteller and she would put all of that together. And it was something you could read and identify with in a different way. Um, and it wasn't texty and it wasn't, it was, it was just real. So I think those are the differences too. And you'll see there are great, and I think we need those textbooks because we need people practicing in different fields that really understand this. So I'm so glad that a huge number of American Korean adoptees uh, are researchers and they're amazing. And I love that people who get it are doing the work. The more we can really interject ourselves in the professions, the better we are able to reach the people who need our help. So I think it's great that Nancy wrote her second book, but it isn't for the regular run of the mill adoptee to read. Yeah. yeah. I wonder why she didn't do that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the, um, the, let's go back to the strength thing. So, um, I, you know, you've, you've, you've touched on the, obviously the, the role of the therapist, you've touched on the role of being in community with other, um, other adoptees. What, where, where do, where do you think we find that strength? Well, within, you know, the boring quickie answer is within. I mean, really, I think we have to uh, adopt ourselves. We have to come to the point where we claim ourselves. We completely claim ourselves. With One of the things that I loved, I had an experience once when I was giving a keynote in Hawaii. And um, I, there was another keynote, and he was an adopted Hawaiian gentleman. And so he went first and the conference opened and there were drummers drumming and he was chanting and it was unbelievable. It was so moving. Everyone was touched and moved by the, the drumming and the chanting, gorgeous. And when he finished, he said, I'm a uh, Hanai. And in Hawaii, if you're in an open adoption, it's the Hanai system. And it's very, it's what we should strive for. And I was so amazed by what he said. He said, what I chanted for you is the lineage of my birth family and the lineage of my adoption, of my adoptive family. And I'm the vessel that holds two families. And it's a source of great pride to be that person who holds all of the legacies of both of those families together. And I thought, oh, my God, this is, you know, this is amazing. And that didn't mean that his family wasn't dysfunctional, both of them. It didn't mean that there weren't terrible people who abandoned and wonderful people who cherished. It just meant that he claimed his status as this person who held all of this and that it was an amazing thing. And, um, you know, I've just taken that with me and thought, this is really how you, you heal in some way. You somehow take the good bits from everything that came to you, and then you claim yourself. And then in my case, I named myself. I took back my, McGuire is my original name. I was Jean Marie McGuire on my birth certificate. And then I was Joyce. Uh, Marie Dugan in my in my adoptive family and then I married and I was Joyce Marie Pavo. I got rid of Marie and put McGuire in so I have a name from my adoptive family they named me Joyce I have a name from my birth family McGuire was on my birth certificate and I kept my ex-husband's name so I'd have the same name as my daughter 
And I feel like there's some, there are different ways you can claim yourself, but sometimes you need something, you know, some hard science to put it down and to make sense of it. Yeah. Um, and I think that claiming yourself and finding things about yourself that are strengths that, you know, you're a gladiator, Simon, and everyone listening to this is because they have gone through hell and back. That we are unbelievable in terms of being on quests. We've been taken away. We've been placed in different places. Every Bible story, every myth and every fairy tale is filled with adoption because it is an archetypal theme. And we are archetypes and we have a chance to pull. I mean, we didn't choose this. We don't choose this. We'd rather have had our lives be as they might have been. But this is what we've gotten. And so how do we get to a place where we take that in and claim it? I don't know. Through inspiration, you know, uh, in the um, as you were telling that Hawaiian story, I was uh, I was touched, and I also I was transported back to a few weddings that I've been to, where you know the different people are doing the speeches, and uh, and the, the so it's like there's some sort of competition about you know like welcome to our family, no 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 welcome to our family, <laughs> and it's just like it's the egos of the father of the bride and the you know like the, 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 uh, father of the bride and father father, father of the, the the groom and 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 the, you know they're, they're both trying to rest it uh, and and so because of what you said about th that's that's separating off right, right. it's like it, it's like brit it, it's like britain and brexit you know we left the eu right so you sh who shrinks themselves to greatness right it doesn't happen. You don't shrink yourself to greatness. It, do, it, it doesn't work, right? But if you 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 scare the 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 the, the um, we had Brexit because the politicians scared scared the electorate, right? Okay, and so we, we don't. But we the inspiration comes from within, you know. Like uh, as you say, gladiators. You know how many. There's that fantastic, um, a fantastic quote by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt about the glad the, the one the, for the people in the the people that are in the dust and fall and get up again. Uh, have you heard? You know the one. It, it's, I, I it's, it's, not, it's not about the. It's not about the audience. It's not about the people that fall down and stay down. It's about the people that stand up and go go up up again and you know that fantastic film of the gladiator film when he, he, he uh russell crowe character dies maximus dies at the end but he's reunited re reunited with his family so yeah that, yep. that's um partic maybe particularly poignant or uh, not the right thing to say on an adoption podcast but that pride like you know we've got we've got lgbtq pride and all that sort of stuff we don't there's no pride in in the uh, the adoptee land, well, very little. I can see it. it it's um, well, you, there, not... there can't be pride until you've accepted, and there shouldn't be pride. The way this has been done, the secrecy, the I mean, the things that have been done have been done so wrong that it's hard to get a to a place where you feel proud of something. And I think we need we have a lot to do before we get to that place. But personal pride to feel, oh, you know, you're you're doing well. I, I'm dealing with a chronic illness in the last two years. And I, I'm the type of person who I used to be a multitasker with the, you know, photographic memory. Now I'm like blurry and, uh, you know, I'm old and decrepit. And um, one of the things that I think is... Listeners, is, do, you, do you think Joyce sounds old and decrepit? It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> sound that way to me, right? Anyway, go on. Well, you know, I, I think it's really, really important for people to be able to claim who they are and where they're at. So now when people say, how do you feel? Because they know I've been very sick. I say, good enough. My new answer is good enough. 
I don't want to say, oh, today I'm like having a chronic flare up and I'm blah. Oh, who wants to hear that? I don't even want to say it. So I just say I'm good enough. I'm I'm up, I'm out, I'm doing things, I'm talking to Simon, I'm good enough. So I would like to see adoptees get to the point where they still know they hurt. They still know they have uh, wounds and, and trauma and issues, but that they're good enough and they're doing well. They're doing well, the best that they can do at the time with the circumstances. And I think that's that's what strength is to be able to do that, to be able to deal. You, you don't necessarily show your strength if everything's perfect. Um, everything isn't perfect, but it's what we've got. So how do we do it? How do we make it make sense? How do we survive and thrive? We're all surviving for now, but we need to survive and thrive. We need to be able to be our best selves. We need to be able to feel as good as we can the days that we can feel that good. Yeah. So I'm not sure where to answer back, uh, go go on this one. Um, so there's a difference between everybody at, at the swimming pool. Um, I joke to the the lads and, and the lasses that work at the swimming pool. I ask them how they do, how are you? Um, and uh, they say, not bad. And I occasionally I drop it in. If you got this, there's there's a there's a case, there's an epidemic of not bad itis around here. And they look at me like I'm nuts, and clearly I am. But um, so yeah, for not bad, not bad to 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 to, to good enough um, is a uh, is a big is a huge step forward, and we go we we keep on stepping, right? I've been saying to a few people recently, where are the you know where where are the where are the leaders in this space and like you've been blazing the trail for quite some time you know um over 50 years as you say and and i i i came up with something a few months ago and um it came to me in a in a couple of different moments years between each other and it was and i put them together and it and it it was something like this: the agony of insufficiency, the relief of sufficiency, and the bliss of infinity. So we're somewhere on that. <laughs> we're somewhere on that scale, right? Absolutely. We're somewhere on the scale. And if you've got to the end of this, listeners, you're 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 hanging out in the right place for insights. You know, like that's what changes. You had that insight when you thought, um, yeah, I love that. Adopt ourselves, claim ourselves. You you did it in your own way with the 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 the, the name stuff, um, with with the name changes. Your client did it in his or her own way with the birth certificate changes and the unadoption and all, all that you know like we find our own we find our own way in 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 the moment i do it with the i do it with the podcast that was the way that i i decided to do it and i've started a few books and got to 10 12 000 words and then not being happy with it not being sure of the structure so i keep podcasting until i till, till i come up with the uh, the, the the structure for it, but we've we've got to go out and find our, our, our own ways. And um, pride may be a step too far, but right now, but it, it it might be it might be there down the down the line if we keep on learning. And to go back to the confirmation bias thing, right? Stuck in our ways. We talked about that last time when I spoke to you last month, mate, about being stuck. Well, who wants to be stuck? You've got to be. If what did somebody say? You know, if you're in, if uh, if you're going through tough stuff, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Don't stop. Um, right, right. That's uh, the worst thing is to stay stuck. Just move. Just get help. Help yourself to move through to the next place. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, you're just spinning your wheels if you're stuck. And that's so frustrating and so upsetting and so depressing. Yeah. And you know, that next, um, the, the thing that's coming to my mind uh, is that, I think it's Indiana Jones, the first one, Temple of Doom, where they're crossing the chasm and and, uh, and the, the stone, the, the next step, there's these stepping stones appear, don't they, across the chasm. Just, they're just sitting in 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 air, but they only appear one at a time, and and it only makes sense looking back. You know, you just take the next step. You don't need to plan all the way. Uh, the, the 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 journey. You just keep on taking the next step, and all the people in there's a lot of people in the self help work or the marketing world, and the, the anybody in the training world, they say to us. Um, I was just like you until I dis- I was struggling and then I, and then I discovered the seven steps too and th- that only they only made sense of that looking back it's retro um justified isn't it so and and they 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 know that we're confused and bewildered and they offer us this way this this way out with this certainty and we fall for it it doesn't work because it hasn't got the same oomph as it when they did we just have to keep doing the next step or the micro step Uh, and that that's all we can do to make sense absolutely you have to find your own way i mean you know again each person is different and has their own set of skills and set of strategies and things that will help them to move. And it's not the same as for the person before you. But the the message is find your way, find the thing that gives you that hope and that moves you in that direction and that allows you to love yourself and claim yourself. You're worth it. Yeah, worth, I mean, you know, I'm about to do a, a training, uh, a year long thing with Anne Heffron on money. And all adoptees, and we're going to talk about money and value. And one of the problems, adoptees' self-esteem and not feeling that they're worth very much is a huge problem. And it it does show up in terms of money and uh, and value and worth and ways that we present in the world. And I think this is, you know, each person has their own issue around that uh, of how to get to a place where you do feel uh you know that you claimed yourself and that you've adopted yourself and that you've you know birthed yourself that you have all of the pieces to make yourself whole yeah um I've, I've got so much to say on that um i think i'll, I'll just sum it up by saying you know i think we 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 get as society, and this isn't just adopted, we get our self worth mixed up with our net worth. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, I, the the uh, some listeners may, I know seventy percent of the listeners are in the states. So the the one of the key difference between U.S. adoption and U.K. adoption is no, no money changes hands in the U.K. Not for a domestic uh, adoption, uh, and I think that that adds another complication into the mix. You know, like I, I, I've seen price lists and they made, they made me want to be sick, especially because it was different prices for different colors. Absolutely. That really made me want to be sick. Absolutely. And I did a lot of work in the UK. I used to work yeah. uh, very closely with after adoption in the 80s and 90s. And there are differences mm-hmm. in our countries, but there are, the bottom line, the issues of the psychology, the emotions, all of that is exactly the same. And but it's affected in different ways. You're absolutely right. I I worked in New Zealand also, and there was no money exchanged. And that why was why is there money exchanged? These are human beings. Yeah. Um, I think that that's that's a real problem in in American adoptions. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce. I, I, sorry, have I asked you? Uh, have I? Is there anything that I've not asked you that you'd love to share with the fellow adoptees out there? 
Oh, I think we could talk for two days at least. Uh, yeah. There's so much more. I think we touched on some important things and I think we missed so many things, but yeah. it'll be another day. There will be another day, definitely. Thanks a lot. Thanks, George. Thank you, listeners. And uh, Thanks. we'll speak to you very soon. Bye-bye.